Great. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, Chris Alderson here um, from Chasins. Um, we've got a um, long overdue topic um, we're talking about today um, on today's webinar. Um, and I'll introduce um, Dr. Sid Bambari in, in a second. Um, for those who um, have just joined, we did have um, our usual sort of warning slide up just at the beginning that we are talking about mental health, potentially suicide um, type um, information today. Um, could be triggering to some people, we never know. Um, so it's just from a safety perspective, just making sure that you're taking care of yourselves. Um, and at the end of the webinar, there will be some numbers um, that we typically put up um, if people do need help or uh, are looking for other help for themselves or, or for others. Um, so look, um, this this topic is one that's um, dear to my heart, and I'm sure it's dear to many of the people who are logging on to this webinar today. Um, it's why you're here. And, and it's one that's kind of emerged um, over the last 10 years. I, I can remember being a, a consultant at PwC probably around about 2015, um, working on safety consulting, and it, it became an overwhelming um, requirement from many of the clients we were talking to that they needed advice and guidance around this new topic of mental health in the workplace. And, and ever since then, I guess we've been pushing into this area um, as health and safety professionals, as, 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 um, as business leaders, um, and it's not an easy area, um, let's, let's face it. It's um, one that we're not naturally... Um, educated on, um, and it's one that's incredibly complex. Um, and look, um, we're really grateful today to um, have um, Sid with us. I'll just um, give you a quick um, bio from his point of view. Um, Dr. Sid Bandari is an assistant research professor in civil, environmental, and architectural engineering department at the University of Colorado Boulder. He's also the Associate Director of Research at the Construction Safety Research Alliance, and we've had um, some of his colleagues on our webinars before, and we're very grateful for them. Um, he earned his uh, Bachelor of Science 2014, Master's 2017, PhD in 2019 in Civil Engineering from uh, Colorado. Um, Dr. Bandari's research uh, expertise exists at the nexus of safety leading indicators, hazard recognition programs, adult learning, human factors, engineering, and mental health to improve health and safety on construction sites. Since 2013, he's provided safety training to over 2,000 workers across different companies, and he works directly with over 100 construction organizations every year to advance their health and safety mission. He's published over 30 peer-reviewed papers, and one of his papers in particular, a guide, will make available um, after the webinar um, when we put it up on our um, website, so please have a look at that. Um, he oversees more than a quarter of a million US every year in external funding. He's received um, a National Safety Council, Council's Rising Star of Safety Award in 2021, amongst um, many other um, awards. So look, we're really glad um, to have you here, Sid. And um, um, it's, it's, it's early afternoon here. Um, you're signing on from Colorado. Um, I hope you're well. And uh, what time is it over there? It is 6.05. Excellent. Um, so over to you. Yeah, I'm excited to be having this session. Thanks, Chris. Uh, thank you, Susan. And thank you all for joining today. I'm, I'm very excited to present some of the research that uh, we've been doing at the CSRA. Um, I'm going to jump right into it here. Give me one second to share my screen, please. All right. Chris, let me know if uh, something's amiss, but I'm going to assume everything's good. So we're just going to get cracking. <clears throat> One of the things that I like to talk about before I start this presentation, even though I've got uh, I've got my title there um, as Dr. Sid Pandari, is that still in this, when it comes to this particular topic, I'm a fake doctor. I don't have medical background. I have a doctor in philosophy. Uh, and that's an important thing to pay attention to. It's an important thing to pay attention to because we are, like Chris mentioned, not naturally educated in this topic. We have lived experiences, many of us these days, unfortunately, um, especially after COVID and the way world has evolved socioeconomically and um, geopolitically as well. We're all dealing with different issues. And so through that lived experience, we have started to develop some understanding of mental health. But what that does is, as we are learning to empathize with the issue, we are also coming up with some 
what I would call biases, inadvertent biases. Biases because we are it's based on just our lived experience or our social circle, what news we read, what articles we read, and such, so on and so forth. It's not necessarily rooted in scientific evidence. And so what I want to show today to you from our research standpoint is where have we sort of stumbled in our good intentioned effort to rectify this problem that exists, then transition towards the idea of with this problem that is existing within construction, and it's undeniable that we have a problem, where does organization's role really fit in? Uh, we can't necessarily become people's counselors. We can't become the, the medicine that is necessary to cure, but we can be in the preventative business. And so I want to present sort of my presentation today as, as this notion that we are aiming a little too much towards the cure side, where we will stumble into, you know, engaging with silver bullet solutions and snake oil solutions at times, because some consultant or somebody else will make a valid pitch, if you will. And what we should be emphasizing very heavily is the preventative side of mental health and providing as many resources as possible from on the on the cure side rather than diagnosis and a culture where we are encouraging people to to give each other dysfunctional solutions. So that will be the gist or the roadmap of what I would like to present today. So with that in mind, why, why do we need to act? Um, I'm sure everybody on this call already knows, and I'm not going to belabor that point very much. But um, within the US, we have recorded five times higher than national average suicide rate among construction workers. That number has been um, not re-examined uh, on a federal level since 2016. Uh, this was a 2016 number that was reported in 2020. But there are plenty of other evidences that are coming out within the construction industry that there are problems. Number one is increasing uh, addiction to opioids and substances, some um, legal and some illicit. And therein is also a problem that we are having to address. And these addictions are not just necessarily addictions to um, substances. This is addiction to online world, virtual world. It is addictions to gambling. It is addiction to alcohol to a point where it has become excessive and unhealthy. And that data is also coming in. And we are seeing that construction workers on average are higher susceptibility wise. They're higher than the general population. And this is also true with the idea that people are now opening up and they're sharing their self-reported cases of severe mental illnesses. And which is, you know, surprising given that this is an industry which, true to its uh, uh, in infamity, is is in you know, is responsible for some amount of toxic masculinity. It has certain traits that traditionally have been considered to be non-conducive to um, an open and frank conversation around mental health. And it is not necessarily the fault of the people we employ. It is the, the industry. It is the kind of work we ask people to do. And those are the traits that, that get rewarded. Um, so it's not necessarily bad or good that we are, we are labeling things with. We are just going to be acknowledging some of these conditions that exist. And despite those conditions, we are finding that construction industry does have a mental health problem within a global pandemic that is happening with regards to mental health as well. So as I mentioned to you, I'm gonna move a little more quickly now, is that my roadmap for you is to first start with what not to do. When, in, when dealing with health and anything to do with the health, we cannot be throwing the kitchen sink here because, the, because there are options, there are conditions in which we may induce inadvertent harm. And I will show you a few examples as well of that. That will lead me into, now that I've established what is it that we shouldn't be engaging in, what is it that we can do, and what is it that we should do. So good intentions do not equal good evidence. In the early uh, 1900s, we had transorbital lobotomy, which was not just something that somebody cooked up in a you know, Frankenstein lab. 
this was what most professional, well-respected psychiatrists, psychologists, medical professionals believed was the right approach to dealing with what they considered mental illnesses. And when it reached their perceptions of hysteria, their perceptions of chronic mental illnesses that was resulting in violence, their solution to that was lobotomy. And there are journal papers that you can find from that decades, um, from those decades that that support that this was the most humane way of dealing with it. Now, obviously, with time and as as we have proceeded with understanding of medicine and medicine itself as a science making progress, we realize we don't have to do that. Um, but at certain points in time in history, that was considered a good solution. Similarly, electric shock therapy in the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s as well, that was considered, again, a humane way of dealing with um, mental health hysteria and psychosis as those, those issues were labeled. So this remains a problem. And I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but very recent publications are showing that all the things that we are doing today, right now, are also not effective. Maybe not as harmful, so, uh, let me rephrase, certainly not as harmful as the previous slide that I was sharing examples of. But unfortunately, what we are finding, and you are welcome to you know, read this paper on, the, on the, this particular slide, it's cited in the paper um, that Chris and Susan will be sharing with you as well, is that in a recent study, 46,000 plus workers were sampled across different organizations, not just construction, broadly, and they found the solutions like resiliency training, mindfulness, wellness apps, you name it, it failed. Not necessarily causing harm, but definitely people saying it didn't help them at all. There was no difference between their health outcomes and the health outcomes of people from control group that didn't receive anything. This problem is the fault of sort of us being able to it's it's the problem comes from the fact that we are aiming from uh, aiming for symptoms we're trying to tackle somebody's depression we are trying to tackle somebody's anxiety we are trying to tackle somebody's stress by providing them these resources wherein we are not the right people to be doing that and i'll again show you with some evidence why why that is so first and foremost we need to stop considering the fact that if we implement an intervention, if we provide people with certain resources, the outcome might just be a positive impact or null effect. That's not true. When it comes to health, you can have negative impact. So take a step away from uh, mental health and to give you an example, um, alcohol in most cases is considered safe. People, if they consume it reasonably, it's considered safe. Many people engage in it across the world, of course. Mix it with cough syrup and it becomes almost deadly. It's one of the high, it's one of the number one reasons uh, or number two reasons, I believe, of liver poisoning within North America is people having cough syrup to help them sleep and having alcohol at the same time. In that benign example, I hope to show you that, that you can create by pairing the wrong individual with the wrong solution, a kind of a toxic environment. A good example, another one I will share with you, which is a, from lived experience, if you will, is folks who have not signed up to have mental health conversations on job sites. Even if you tell them it is about destigmatizing, uh, destigmatization, it is about improving the culture, it's not something they've signed up for and they don't appreciate this is again, some evidence is being collected and we're in the process of publishing a paper around it. They don't appreciate having their space, safe space, which is their work, where they come to escape all those problems, be a place suddenly where folks are asking them to talk about their health issues or mental health issues. That is a real problem that we cannot be digging into people's personal lives and opening up that Pandora's box. And this brings me to the final point I'll make about this, which is that we don't intend to create a mental health diagnosis or treatment. None of us, I, I'm confident, most of us, professionally speaking, don't walk in to go into our workspaces to provide mental health diagnosis and treatments. However, we can't control the conversations that are starting to happen around mental health. And what is happening 
is that we don't talk about cancer, broken bones, headaches, any such things with the kind of cavalier nature that we talk with mental health. If we think mental health is a serious health issue, then we need to be just telling people, you need to speak to somebody who's a professional licensed um, person, psychiatrist within this domain, and not us, because we may be providing short-term dysfunctional solutions without realizing that is what we are doing. This is one of the reasons why in schools, Teenagers aren't asked to talk about mental health with each other. They're asked to talk about it with their counselors because they don't trust them to have a responsible conversation amongst us themselves. And if we believe that construction professionals have a stigma around mental health as a topic, we shouldn't expect one training, two training, or a few resources to change that culture. And if we open that Pandora's box, it's very possible we start spreading some dysfunctional solutions. Mental health is extremely complex, like Chris was mentioning in the beginning. Most of us will not be able to distinguish differences between disorders and illnesses. What is the difference? What is the definition of depression? And what is how is it different from anxiety? How is chronic anxiety different from depression? Are they the same things? Can they be used interchangeably? Is stress something different? Is panic attack a consequence of anxiety or is something that is a completely different thing. These things are important. If we are encouraging people to have conversations around these topics, how do we expect them to have good conversations around these topics when they don't know the vocabulary of this particular topic? So whether it is the fact that, <clears throat> excuse me, if I walk up and I, in my day-to-day -day language, I'm like saying things like, don't do that. I have an OCD about it. We started using the word OCD very casually. And I say we as royal we, because the English language is such, we, we all started doing it. And what it does is that it starts to confound some of these things as just like, ah, oh, suck it up, you'll be fine. It comes from the fact that we've used it for a very long time in our language very easily. Now the reverse side of this is what we are seeing on some of the social media um, conversations happening between people is that people are now diagnosing themselves and celebrating their mental health problems. I understand this is a very sliver and a minority, but this is something that is slowly every year increasing, where people are now engaging in this self-diagnosis, identifying with different kinds of issues that they believe that they have. And they may genuinely have mental health related concerns that you need some psychiatric help, but for a lot of reasons, uh, access to professionals and health uh, systems and other things is difficult for folks. And what we have is a good social experiment that we can look at is that, are you happy with what kind of conversations are happening around mental health on social medias? If not, then you must try to not encourage people to have these kinds of conversations around mental health. Now, I will remember this is the part of the presentation where I'm focusing on the nots. So if you feel like, is he telling us not to tell people to speak about their mental health issues and discuss those things? I'm not. But at the same time, we don't want people to be sharing certain amount of details with each other. It's not the right place. It's not appropriate for organizations to be doing that. So what we could do and should do is that have wellness programs that align with a mission statement. And our mission statement cannot be we want to reduce suicide rate. It's not something we can measure. As you probably heard from Dr. Hallowell and Dr. Sherrod is that our safety metrics, we've learned over the last 20, 30 years, our safety metrics were not appropriate. Those lagging indicators that we used to use, like let's just measure how many injuries are happening. We were rewarding randomness. And same, similarly, thankfully, across the world also, we don't have enough suicides happening from a statistical standpoint to be able to predict uh, future performance of our programs. We need a different mission statement. And a mission statement keeps you grounded towards what your objective is. Your objective cannot be this messy room. Your objective can be hey, we want to help people with wellness. Okay, that's an admirable mission statement. Let's work towards that. Or your mission statement is, 
We want to provide people with resources to prevent suicides in future or get them access to help if they need it. That's an admirable one. But your our mission cannot be one that says construction industry or organization A seeks to eliminate suicides because it does two things. Number one, statistically, it's not something you can ever measure whether you're doing well or not well. And second, it's going to put somebody in the driver's seat whose mental health we have disregarded. Say I'm that person and I've been tasked to run that particular mission, that particular program, that particular EAP. Every suicide that does happen, it's on me. And it's the human nature that guilt is something we've heard from safety professionals is that I didn't sign up for a 2 a.m. call from one of my colleagues sharing with me what is gone wrong and me having to rush to a bar or whatever they are, they are at to help them and rescue them. Their mental health has been disregarded is something we've heard from recent focus groups that we've done. That is something we'll be putting out papers and publications as well. So again, this is the portion where I'm telling some of the warning signs of what not to do. And in that spirit, addressing existing mental health issues is not something we are equipped to handle. But what we can do is try and fix work-induced stressors. That is within our gift to give, that is within our control. Fixing somebody's uh, depression or providing them with the right resources is also very difficult because each individual is different. A psychiatrist, a, a psychologist will have to spend months to figure out what is the right you know, approach, language, toolkit that will help people open up and communicate. These are things that cannot be generalized over certain ethnic groups, certain age groups, and so on and so forth. Everybody is very different, and we will not be able to find generalized solutions. That is a proven fact within medical sciences. But we are capable of fixing work-induced stressors, which I will share with you in, in just a little bit. Second takeaway is there are no universal signs of mental health problems. It is one of my pet peeves, if you will, is that we tend to do this approach of see something, say something. To which I say, see what, say what. If your aim is to destigmatize mental health, you cannot be saying, here are the 10 signs to look for to see if somebody may be having suicide ideation, if somebody may be having mental health problems or so on and so forth. Now, there are some obvious physiological signs that can tell somebody that they might be struggling or they might be having certain problems, slurred speech, having extremely uh, alcoholic breath or something along those lines. That's a different situation. That's fitness for duty. However, the point I'm trying to make is that if you see somebody having sleep issues, if you see somebody having a lot of fatigue, if you see somebody having a lot of mood swings and anxiety and these kinds of issues, you don't know if that, or actually my apologies, not just you, none of us know if that is a mental health problem or they have a hyperactive thyroid, because it could be a thyroid issue. And that is why we cannot be destigmatizing mental health by saying, this is a, cu a cutout of somebody who looks depressed and has mental health problems. There are many publications that show people who have mental health problems are most equipped at hiding them, especially in public. They're pretty adept at hiding those things. So it's very important for us to be not doing necessarily peer supporting, but doing peer signposting. If somebody comes up, I walk up to Chris and I say, hey, Chris, I'm, I'm really struggling, man. I'm having all these health issues. I'm having these mental health issues. Uh, what do I do? We need to be signposting them towards the right validated resources that the organizations can provide, not necessarily saying, sit down, let's have a chat. Let's figure out what is wrong. Let's see what we can do about it. That may not be always the best solution. Remember one thing, and I, I hate to do this to you all, but I will do it once. This is my, my proposition to you all. It is possible that somebody can deliver a positive impact from the conversation they have. It is possible that they may have no impact from the conversation they have. And it is possible that they may make the problem worse because somebody's disorder, illness, or situation 
made them irrationally react to the conversation that they've had. This is what my key element to what not to do. So with that in mind, uh, pattern matching can lead to bias. We've seen it. It creates stereotypes and we must fight against these 10 signs of depression, 10 signs of suicide ideation. There is no research that backs this up, that this information is generalizable across broader audience. Zero research that exists. The research that does exist is on very small sample sizes and oftentimes with very dubious clinical, clinical experiments. And so my final point is, the example I like to give is a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. This goes usually very well with the US audience, so hopefully we'll see how it plays out here. But if I roll out some peanut butter jelly sandwiches, it's lunchtime for you all. Um, you know, most of you will be pretty happy. It's a, it's a comfort food for many, you know, bread and jelly and peanut butter. That's at least in US, that's it's comfort food for many and they're pretty happy with it. Few people complain, this is not the thing I wanted, but whatever, I'll eat it. it you know, I, I prefer bigger spread. I wanted something more savory, whatever have you. And then a couple of people might have an anaphylactic shock because I didn't realize that they have peanut allergy because I didn't ask them or I didn't know. And here's the kicker. And I know CPR has the wrong approach to an anaphylactic shock. And I actually put that for in a uh, purposely in the presentation. When it comes to mental health, we non-professionals don't know what right questions to ask before we find out, um, hey, do you have the peanut, uh, you have a peanut allergy. We don't know what the equivalent question to ask before we pair somebody up with a solution, number one. Number two, even if we do pair somebody up with the wrong solution, or even if we pair them up with the right solution, we won't be able to sustain those gains because we don't have the expertise, or we may not be able to you know, rectify the situation because uh, somebody could have a lasting harm done. So the trust me bro is not evidence. Even if I have lived through it and I have successfully dealt with uh, a mental health problem using meditation, it might induce somebody else to give that person who's recommending meditation a punch because it may feel that they're trivializing the problem by suggesting something obvious, which may not be the intention that that suggestion was made with. But you can understand this is the, the, the complexity of human conversations and human interactions. And there are certain papers and certain consultants we've seen that are masquerading as mental health experts, and they are just people who are making a quick buck out of a uh, crisis that the industry is experiencing in its desperation for solutions we are placing faith in some very bad actors primarily mental health first aid training culture first conversation wearable technology ai chatbots i have tons of examples that i can share with you after uh, in the q a portion if you're interested but none of them have any clinical studies backing up that that is a valid approach to dealing with mental health problems and if you are from the safety world, one example I like to give, even if you're not from the safety world, but you'll get this, is that if you desire a solution, a solution shall appear. If I ask ChatGPT right now to find me a solution, ChatGPT will try very hard to come up with a solution and in some cases even make up solutions. Similarly, any pyramid can be made. This is just my Google of uh, wellness pyramids and 100,000 different wellness pyramids appeared right like that as soon as I did the search. So if you desire a solution, a solution shall appear. And that is that is something we, we must be careful about. So the mantra I will end you this section with of what not to do is that I want to leave you with is we want to do something, not anything. With that in mind, let's move towards what is it that we can do. What we did, excuse me, is we launched a survey across US and Canadian construction companies. We had about uh, 1,200 people who participated, uh, around 500 were from the field, and you can see representation from Hispanic workers, representation from 
uh, younger workers and yes, representation from uh, much more mature workers was well distributed within our sample. And we asked them a few questions. We asked them first and foremost to rank the different stressors that have been discussed within the literature of uh, things that construction workers are struggling with. I didn't want, we didn't want to necessarily come back to you all and bring another 10 stressors that are pro uh, creating problems. What we wanted to do was out of the 20, 30, 40 stressors that have been identified, where is it that you should put your safety money towards? We all have limited resources. What is going to create the biggest ROI, the biggest bang for the buck? We ask people to rank these stresses while they are relative to each other. And so we found a few things. To the question we asked, is construction industry responsible for, for, poor, for poor mental health trends? You can see a perfect disagreement, which highlights some of the conversation I just had with you all on what not to do, which is if you roll out any resources, any solution when it comes to mental health, there will be um, some people happy and some people not so happy. And our job is to make sure that whatever we do, we engage in no harm. So the construction industry is not the boogeyman that has it has been made out to be, as we can clearly see from the data. But it has some systemic issues that we may need to address specifically. And you're going to find these stressors, the top three stressors to not be surprising. What is surprising is that these three stressors were consistent across all demographic groups, young, old, field, people working in the field, people working in the office, Hispanic, Caucasians, and other minority groups. You name it, we found it. These top, these top three did not change. Number one, financial uncertainty. Surprise, surprise, right? We, the, the stressors are not surprising, but what is surprising is that they are consistent across the field. Work demands. Now, you might be surprised with work demands the next bit I say. It's not necessarily that people feel that they're overworked. They were very clear. We did recent focus groups, and again, a paper is going to be published very soon about it. They're not necessarily overworked. They are struggling to meet the schedule that is being set for them. They feel like they can perform better. They can do it much more happily and healthily if the same work was a little bit more spaced out. And in some cases, they place the blame directly on the schedule. And in some cases, they place, place the blame on their frontline supervisors who induce stress by transferring their schedule pressure onto or their stress onto the frontline workers. So there are some nuances here in work demands. With financial uncertainty, we found that its construction workers are not necessarily blaming the construction industry. They're blaming the socioeconomic conditions across most of the Western countries, even Eastern countries and Australia and New Zealand as well is that people are struggling to make ends meet. And what gets exacerbated in construction is the fact that work is cyclical. You don't have great job security. You don't know if you're gonna be engaged on the next project. And of course, this thing gets different across countries and unions and non-unions. But generally speaking, financial uncertainties folks are struggling with. Dr. Helen Lingard, you may be familiar with, um, has done some phenomenal work as well as Dr. Michelle Turner. And their results are very similar with people having burnouts and financial uncertainty and so on and so forth within um, the Australian construction industry as well. And finally, the third one, I, I do have a, a little, uh, let me see on time, I'm doing very well. Uh, I do have one little primer for you all. The third one happened to be factors outside the work um, that they had rated as the third most important stressor. But since we have discussed that factors outside the work is not within the purview of the organization, we should provide people with good health insurance. We should provide them with uh, counseling services on site, maybe off site as well. But that's not within the purview. The fourth most important stressor, therefore, were limited opportunities for growth. And in most cases, we found that it's not necessarily that people hate the trajectory they're on, it's that they didn't know what trajectory they were going to be on. So there is opportunities for some leadership engagement, some other opportunities to have these kinds of conversations with people that elucidate their, their journey a little better and gives them some sense of security as well as some kind of understanding of 
why they are doing what they are doing within this company. How do, how does their work mean um, or add value to the company? The validation can go a long way. Finding number three, peer support. And we found that when we asked the question, I would like my managers, my leaders, my coworkers to check in with me about my mental health in the workplace in a quiet and private setting. Look at that again. Perfect disagreement. Some people are like, sure, let's have a conversation. And some people are like, nope, that's not what I signed up for. And we must be very careful by making sure we don't have anything mandatory when it comes to mental health. We provide as many optional strategies and resources for folks, which most companies are genuinely doing that. But this is the evidence that helps us understand that look, mandatory approaches will not necessarily work. Um, it may turn people away from right resources and right kind of help. Last finding that I have for you all is we ask people, what is the most desired wellness outcome that your organization can help you achieve? And again, the results of the wellness outcomes will not be surprising. What is surprising is that it was the same three rankings across all the demographic groups again. And we did have a substantial demographic group showing us the, showing us these findings. So job satisfaction, financial security, and sense of community. Now, I've already spoken about uh, financial security, uh, so I won't necessarily belabor that point more. Job satisfaction encompasses a broad number of things from the fact that people feel happy to be at work. This means they are able to deliver what is being asked of them. Construction workers are very proud. Very, they take a lot of pride in their work. They are technically proficient in ways that no other uh, PhDs and master's degrees, bachelor's degrees, we would struggle to do what they do. Um, and so that kind of respect um, they have for their work. And that is something that we can do better to communicate. The sense of community part is very important, again, for them. They don't necessarily work in these sectors um, because it's the society looks at it as the, the most lucrative jobs. That's not why people do these things. They do it because their grandfathers and their fathers and their mothers and their sisters have been in this industry doing some great work. People take pride and they, they like that sense of community. So whatever the organization can do to build that relationship between coworkers and between the supervisors and, and the frontline people can go a long way. So in a nutshell, we would you know urge you to ask these two questions of yourself which is that are your interventions designed towards the most important work-related stresses? And if they are, what metrics can we use to determine whether our interventions are working or not? We don't want to be in the place where it's just a black hole where money just keeps going. And I keep belaboring this and I don't want to be cheap about talking about resources and practical limitations. With, with regards to mental health, it feels a bit cavalier that I'm mentioning that. But unfortunately, resources are always going to be limited. And I don't need to be uh, lecturing folks who actually have to deal with this battle every day. But our goal is that we don't make the same mistakes that were made in safety, for example, which is the pile of things that we do is that big. And now we don't know in that pile, what are some of the things that we're doing that is most efficacious and what are the things that we're doing that don't really work? So we wanna avoid that mistake with mental health. So as I wrap up, what should we do? The guidebook that Chris and Susan will be sharing with you talks a little bit about how is it that you can design a program that'll help you create a mental health program that is taking in good evidence, good sound evidence and putting out uh, reasonable results on the other side. So one of the things that we've done is create a framework for you all, which is a framework that you can deploy within your organizations to start building a good system with which people are provided resources and help. First of all, the folks you are tasking with this particular responsibility need to be educated on mental health crisis. Um, and it's not just learning how to be supportive and empathetic, that, that it's just picking somebody who is high on emotional intelligence, it's also about somebody who understands the vernacular that is used within medical sciences. Second, we make sure that we have defined roles and expectations of everybody involved. It can't be, let's 
solve the problem and tap on the shoulder to some people and say, go solve the problem. What is the role of the C-suite? How are they going to depose some of the strategies and interventions that are being pitched to prevent mental health problems that are happening within our workforce? What are the site leaders' responsibilities to ensure that bullying, harassment, and any of such kinds of ill-intentioned behavior is, is rectified accounted for and addressed immediately? And then what are the expectations from the employees? How are they supposed to conduct themselves? Are those expectations clearly and eloquently communicated? Creating a formal program with an achievable mission. I've already spoken about it, but this is very important. This allows you to hold people who are doing your work accountable and they know whether they're delivering what they've been asked to do. Backing in scientifically backed initiatives, uh, sorry, investing in scientifically backed initiatives and making sure we understand how to communicate this to people. The last thing I'll mention about this is it's not just easy. It's not as simple as finding the right solution and telling people, here's the solution. They may have resistance about it. Even if some if something isn't good for them, they may not necessarily buy into that because mental health is rife with different kinds of biases and stereotypes. And so what kind of communication strategy will we use to help people understand why this resource is being provided to them? How is it supposed to support them? And so on and so forth. How do we bridge that divide between them understanding this is necessary and them understanding how it supports them? So asking as senior leaders and managers, we, we also ask people, you should ask a few important questions. What is the objective of your intervention? Qualifications. Let's say Dr. Pandari has walked up and said, I want to pitch you a solution and you just need to pay me this amount of money and I will I will solve your wellness problem. And then you ask for my qualifications and you see PhD in civil engineering and you throw my resume out and my intervention and my butt as well from the office. That's appropriate because I'm not appropriately qualified to be pitching you direct solutions. But these are some of the questions you should be asking. Does it align with your mission? Now that you have a mission statement, you can select interventions more judiciously and more strategically. Then, of course, we have a competency in-house to make sure that this implementation can happen and you can deliver on this. And of course, where's the scientific evidence, which means it must be peer-reviewed, it must be published in a journal that is respected, and the validity of results can be backed up with a clinical study because you're dealing with health as an issue. And have they presented the limitations of the work? So the last slide I have for you is the work presented today has given everybody a target to aim towards. The industry has been asking for a very long time, what is it that we can do? And the, the pathway we set in front of you is, here are some of the things you can do. Here are the things we can educate ourselves on, what we can create a long runway of things we can achieve down the decade and things we should avoid engaging in because they may cause inadvertent harm that uh, could be could be could be irreversible. By the end of this year, we will be hoping to produce two tools for you all, which will be open access. I'm happy to share them with Chris and Susan, who will be able to share it with you. We want we've created a scorecard that will be able to judge whether your mental health intervention, your resource, is liked by your employees or not. And so we are in the process of validating that scorecard and putting it together. And finally, we're also putting together EAP guide on how EAPs, employee assistance programs, or that's formally your mental health programs, but informally they can be just people who are tasked with solving mental health within your organization. How should they tackle different stressors one by one? And we are doing a case example for everybody so that they can replicate it for other kinds of stressors. So with that, um, Chris, I'll, I'll turn it to you and see if you have any questions that you would like to ask of me. Yeah, Hopefully. thanks, Sid. Um, look, re really informative. I'll just start off just by quickly um, sharing my screen and showing the actual resource that you were talking about um, from CSRA. Um, so that's, that's the guide, right, that's available now. And um, if... We, we'll we'll be putting the links up to this um, as part of it. But if anybody wants to go and get this straight away, um, it's pretty easy to find. So if you Google the CSRA website and you go through their guidance pages, and um, I found it in about three or four clicks. So it's, it's not hard. So if you need to 
get in there and have a look at that um, right now, um, please do so, but it will be also available as a link on our website later on. So, um, look, just a couple of um, questions. I guess one of the things that came through early on, and, and I've been um, involved in this as well in the past, um, made some um, comments there around um, mental health first aid, I guess, and, and I, I imagine it's uh, something that exists in the US as well, where you can go and do a course and you get some basic information about mental health and you can take that back to the workplace. Um, what, what's your view on that in terms of um, I sort of got from your from your paper and from what you said there that um, it wasn't something that had any evidence behind it. Does it actually hurt or is it something we should be dropping or what's what's the consensus? So Chris, uh, great question. Um, if I had more time, I would I would uh, elaborate on it uh, during my presentation. But uh, mental health first aid trainings by in and itsol itself don't have any necessarily harm that we can see. Uh, there's no harm in getting people those access. In many cases, they can educate folks who don't even have the baseline appreciation of mental health problems reach that particular consensus. My only concern from those first aid trainings is it it puts a lot of responsibility onto people who don't have a lot of stake in making systemic changes within the industry to help people with their wellness. Um, if somebody is struggling with financial uncertainty and you have a supervisor or a safety manager or something, somebody in the middle management go in and take this course, they don't necessarily have any resource to help people with that makes a long-term lasting impact. So yes, it can help folks be more empathetic. Yes, it can provide some short-term value, but there is very limited evidence that says it can be efficacious in long-term is what I will say. Right. Um, or we need a study. We need. We don't have a study yet that has done any long-term implications on this one. Yes. Um, another question that's just come through, and, and this is something that um, was asked, if we recognise a change in a person's habits, demeanour, visible health, the fear of trivialising the condition can't approach the individual with advice in quotation marks. How do you suggest we ensure assistance is sought and or given? And I don't think from what you were saying that we shouldn't approach them. I don't I don't think that's what you are meaning, but I just want to clarify that. The clarification I'll give there is it's okay to walk up to somebody and say, how are you doing, mate? And have a conversation from there onwards. But let's not assume that somebody's changed demeanor or behavior correlates with a mental health problem. It could be physical health. It could be mental health. It could simply be that they're having a shitty day or a shitty week or what have you. It, it could be many number of things. And the only concern I wanted to tell you and communicate from that particular portion was we don't have any data that says these are the facial expressions, these are the symptoms, these are the body behaviors of movements that depict somebody's mental health problems. Um, they change across cultures, they change across people in different social stratas, it changes across people in different economic classes as well. So it it is highly variable. And um, an example I would use is uh, if I go on to TikTok, I think most of the influencers are having mental health crisis because of the way they're behaving and performing. But it's one of those things, but I'm old and I'm outdated on that way. So just as a little tongue in cheek joke, it's going to create more problems as we enter different political cycles and conditions when we start having free for all conversations within our workplaces. When the last 10, 20, 30 years, we've been telling people, that's your personal life. This is your professional life. Keep boundaries, keep them separate. It'll keep everybody happy. Um, question here. I know, I know in your paper, you didn't really cover it in your um, presentation, but you talk about um, signposting um, around, you know, directing people. And I, I take that as directing people towards the appropriate um, medical or clinical response, if, if that's what's necessary. That is something that businesses um, can encourage, isn't it? Yes. And they should. I, I By no means would I say that people shouldn't be given access to resources, but what we should try and encourage people to do is, oh man, I'm, I'm sorry you're having such a tough time. I recommend speaking to XYZ within the company. They were really able to help give me the right resources. They might be able to help you with yours as well. 
what we want to avoid is people having that black back slapping attitude where they say, let's get a few drinks in you and talk about this at a bar. And what happens is typically that just tends to provide much more difficult conversations around um, dysfunctional coping strategies and emotional strategies, not medical strategies. So, sure. yeah. Um, one of the challenges I think in this area, um, I, I wonder if this is in the States, it's very hard in New Zealand at the moment to get access to medical advice, you know, for physical ailments and probably twice or three times as hard um, for mental health as well. So it's it's another barrier in terms of people getting access. Um, do, you, do you see that as another sort of phenomenon around, um, you know, why, why this is such a crisis in terms of, you know, even if you do look go looking for help, um, it's it's incredibly hard to actually find. Well, this answer I would have to actually say I'm not quite sure. I can speak for the US. The US healthcare system, as many of you probably are familiar with it, it's very difficult. It's very expensive. Um, the insurance process and all those different political landmines that that exist. Um, People don't have access to good healthcare system here, oftentimes, and it's true for Can Can uh, the Canadian side as well. I would uh, encourage uh, checking out Dr. Lingard's papers and Dr. Michelle Turner's papers on these things for Australia and New Zealand's context. But I'll say this, um, the challenge we've seen is that people are more and more relying on AI-based solutions, AI-based chatbots, that pretend to be um, psychologists and therapists to provide people with generic, good intentioned messages. And what they end up doing is abnormal amount of harm. So one of the examples you'll see in the guide that uh, was just shared is um, a BBC reporter went into one of these chatbots and pretended to be anorexic. And the app, the app responded by, by saying, keep swimming, or it, one of the, the persons pretended they were uh, a minor having uh, problems with violence within the domestic environment. And the app said, it's always so good to know more about you. And it's, I'm glad to hear you're learning more about yourself. So the problem that is happening is people are not getting access to health uh, licensed professionals and they're turning to these uh, pseudoscience solutions and it is creating a pretty pretty dramatic environment. And for US and Canada, it's more about people not having access to licensed healthcare professionals because there aren't that many. There aren't that many appointments to be had. There aren't that many professionals that can give people um, access. Right. Look, I think um, we'll, we'll stop the online questions there. There are a number of other questions, great questions that have come up. It's quite complicated, though. Some of them, some of them are quite long. What we will attempt to do is we'll We'll um, send them to Dr. Bandari and we'll try and answer as many as possible and put them on the presentation link as well. So just because you've asked a question and we haven't answered it on the um, live, it doesn't mean that it's not a great question and we take it seriously. So um, we'll, 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 we'll do that. Um, I just um, like to sort of end up just really thanking you, Sid, for, for coming online and um, sharing the stuff. And, uh, and I really look forward to um, your work in the future. Um, I think that um, we, this is an area where, look, we, we just haven't seen enough great research, particularly for our industry, and, it, and the fact that it is for construction, although I'm sure it applies to other industries as well, is fantastic. Um, and that, um, look, just, just keep going, and um, we really thank you for your efforts in this area. Appreciate it, Chris. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Chris. Okay, everyone, with that, we'll um, sign up for the day and um, hope everyone has um, a great week. Thank you.